I'm 29 and single and I don't have kids yet. Here's what your Saturday morning looks like when you're single at 29. And I went to Beyonce last night and I didn't get home until 1 a.m. I danced and drank my little heart out and I didn't pay a babysitter to watch my kids as I did that. For anti-freedom freak Matt Walsh, apparently that was a highly offensive video. Mm. They said horrible things. They told me the only way I'd have a kid is if one of them sexually assaulted me. There were questions about my gender because of the size of my skull. They told me that my life was meaningless. I had 7,000 TikTok followers. Um, Matt Walsh has 2.4 million Twitter followers. And they came and attacked me on my video. Did you then start to delete the comments or respond back? Uh, Julia, welcome, welcome. How are Thank you, love? Thank you. Uh, I'm doing well. It's nice to be in the same city. I'm doing really well. <laughs> I know. You're a new transplant. Welcome. Thank welcome you. Welcome to Austin. Um, Thank you. So I want to jump right in because you've literally become kind of this international, global sensation overnight. And we had a conversation on your podcast actually not too long ago, which I will totally link in the show notes. And I actually want to start off by asking, what are you braving now? Well, I just moved to Austin and I left a job in corporate America to do it. Um, and I am really going in and investing in myself and believing in myself and I'm launching a coaching business, I'm creating social media content, and I'm finally kind of ignoring the societal noise and the cultural noise that I grew up with as a Russian Jewish girl who was told to be a lawyer or a doctor. And so I feel like I'm braving a lot right now. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Thanks. This is Thanks. This, so, well, I kind of want to maybe go back a little bit because you mentioned, you know, a lot of things. And I mean, just for the audience, even how we met and kind of all of the factors that led us to even record and, um, and you even holding up my book on a TikTok that went viral where friends were sending me messages like, do you know this woman? What is going on? Um, so let's, because that I, I would probably say initiated a lot of your bravery. Yeah. Yeah. So I um, host a podcast called Pretty Much Done, which you are on, and I explore the relationship with self. And I am a true believer that until you are fully content in yourself is when you're going to find love. And um, I ex talk to dating experts. I talk to influencers, celebrities, authors like yourself who teach you how to tap in and become really comfortable with yourself. So with the podcast, I create social media content all about my journey being single. And as a girl who was Russian Jewish, as I mentioned, I thought you had to be married and have kids to feel content and fulfilled in your life. And I kept chasing that goal. And as I was chasing it, I found myself in these good on paper relationships, these safe relationships and feeling extremely unfulfilled. So I've done the work, I've done the therapy, I've done the plant medicine and realized that it's only me who can make myself feel whole. And all of my social media content is around that. And so I recorded this video, uh, the video that went viral, and I recorded it on a Saturday. I was a little hungover from the Beyonce concert. I was 29 years old at the time, I'm now 30. And I said, you know, whenever I feel this immense pressure or I give myself guilt about where I'm at in my life and that I'm not married and I don't have children. I remember that I can wake up at 10 a.m. on a Saturday. I can cook shakshuka on a Saturday. I can be a little hungover. I didn't have to get a babysitter to go to the Beyonce concert. There are so many benefits of where I'm at. And I was really just trying to explain to people that when you're single, you can enjoy where you're at. It's okay that society tells us that we need to get married and have kids. You can live the life that you want to live. And um, a political right-wing commentator named Matt Walsh took my video. And at the time I had 7,000 TikTok followers. 
Um, Matt Walsh has 2.4 million Twitter followers. So he tweeted it to his 2.4 million followers and they came and attacked me on my video. They said horrible things. They told me that I should, the only way I'd have a kid is one, if one of them sexually assaulted me. There were questions about my gender because of the size of my skull. They told me that my life was meaningless. I uh, look 40, just horrible things that I haven't even read the full extent of, but those are the Cliff Notes versions. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I kind of want to pause you there because that's so much to unpack. And I mean, you're living your truth. You're sharing your best life online. I'm like, if I saw that particular post on a Saturday, I would have been like, yes, queen, because I've got two little ones and my day started at 6 a.m. And I did go to the Beyonce concert, but I had to be home uh, at a certain time. And so, you know, our lives couldn't be more opposite, yet we, I was told Dr. Dentist, lawyer, engineer as well. So I totally get the, you know, your parents, the Russian Jewish plight, totally get that because that's very similar to the Asian upbringing. You know, I feel like it's all tiger parenting at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, we get to challenge that. We get to start to do something different. And what's interesting is that you you know, are sharing your biggest, boldest truth and living your best life. And then you get this slam. And so what's now then going through your body, your nervous system, you know, at this time? And, and I mean, the horrific messages that are coming through, but how are you then supporting yourself? Because I can imagine it going in a whole myriad of ways. Yeah. And because I have done the spiritual work, I now understand that it happened to me at the right time when I was able to handle it. It happened to me three years into the therapy, into me learning my practices that I need to count on and rely on in order to feel normal and stable. Because I'm lucky if it had happened to someone else who didn't have the tools, didn't have the resources, doesn't have the access, I can't imagine what the consequences would have been. So when this started happening, I was really scared and I, because if you Google me, like there's information about me on the internet. I don't know. People are crazy. And I, I deleted TikTok. I, I deleted the app off my phone because I didn't want to engage. I didn't want to read. And I spent time with my cousin and a friend. We had plans to go to the beach. I know that the beach is centering for me. I like to be around the water. I like to watch the sunset. And I honored that and made sure that I made myself go there. And I did my meditation practice in the morning. I, but that's not to say that I wasn't scared. And I, I'd never experienced anything like this. I do my meditation and I do my rituals, but I don't have 500 people berating me in the comments telling me I should be sexually assaulted. So I knew I had to honor that. When it felt safe to come back to TikTok was a friend of mine um, who I went to college with she tweeted in defense of me and she gave context into my platform because a lot of these right-wing commentators or followers of Matt Walsh's, they were upset that I was essentially insinuating that motherhood and, and being a parent is something to be looked down upon, which isn't the case at all. I, I think it's wonderful. My sister's married. She got married at 25. She has two kids. I love being an aunt. It just wasn't my path. She has the traditional white picket fence life and you don't. And that's okay. And I feel like most people at the brave table would obviously agree. You know, what's what I want to, you know, really kind of even double click on for, for you and for anybody who's listening, you know, point blank, this is online bullying. This is bullying at the most extreme levels. And I'm, gosh, I'm so sorry. Like you went through all of that. And I know that there are so many people who I've talked to. There's two schools of thought around this, around, you know, being trolled and bullied. It's like the one, the one hat is like, all right, well, you made it because now you've been canceled, you've been bullied. And, and all of that, that comes along with this kind of like public humiliation in many ways. 
and and can we rise from it and then on the other hand it's like or i can just keep my voice private shut down the app delete it not come back or change you know whatever my username is um and and just pretend like everything is okay and i'll just start something else but you decided you know for lack of a, a better term to kind of go in in the in that first wave of what I'm what I'm talking about. How was that for you? And what, what then started leading you to even kind of respond back? Or what was the biggest thing that you then started to hone in on in your kind of in your defense and your truth? Yeah, I mean, I think I started my content from a place of I've experienced these things, I want people to feel less alone in being okay, being single, defying cultural expectations of us, defying societal expectations of us. So I've been creating content for a year. And this was finally a moment where I realized, oh my God, this isn't just a cultural thing. This isn't just a Russian Jewish thing. This is a societal thing. Mm -hmm. People are hearing, especially women are hearing this all the time. People are telling me my eggs are sand. It's not just me that's being told this. And it made me realize I need to be this voice. I, I need to step into this because it is so much bigger than I thought it was. And people like Matt Walsh and his 2.4 million followers are showing me that. And so I need to be the person to rise. I'm, I'm being given this opportunity where I need to rise to the occasion and not hunker down and allow them to win. I need to show up for the people who tell me, you make me feel less alone. Thank you. I grew up in a similar household. I appreciate you. I feel like you're telling me all the things that I think in my head. And it made me realize that I need to rise to the occasion and be resilient like you talk about. And so, you know, I kind of even want to ask for, for you, did you then start to, uh, you know, delete the comments or respond back? Like, is there a playbook for anybody listening who perhaps, you know, isn't as brave as you? I mean, it's a, such a bold and brave move to kind of go up against 2.2 whatever million followers of, 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 of men who have this particular view and it's so easy to shit on, you know, a 29-year-old woman with with big, bodacious, and bold dreams, and that's why you're at the brave table. But is there a, pr a playbook for anyone who is maybe climbing out and, and sharing their voice for the first time, and they get their first troll, or they get, you know, uh, like hate comments, or, you know, I feel like now more than ever, there's so much polarity uh, in the world how how do you then respond to that and and what advice would you give for people who are kind of navigating through that yeah on a granular granular level i still have not read the full extent of the comments on that video it's gotten 30 million plus impressions i don't need to dig myself into that hole of reading everything that has been said about me that being said i constantly get trolls now it's like <laughs> It's like when you go viral, you're going to have probably 50% of people who agree with you and 50% who don't. And that's just what comes with the territory. So I ha I thought I used to would be someone who wouldn't engage. But sometimes like people say, you've made being 30 and single your entire personality. And I can't help myself but respond, okay. And it's a full stop. Because yeah, that's that's my choice. And when people what helps me and I hopefully helps people understand is if you are someone who finds joy or needs to stop on someone's content and say something really mean or evil to them, it says so much more about them and where they're at than it does about anything about you because they have a one minute snippet of your life Whereas I have at this point 30 years of my life, I know exactly who I am. I know where I stand and I know all the work I've done on myself. And I know that someone calling me stupid and meaningless is, it's not accurate. I know my life is meaningful. I know the relationships I have. So 
me allowing their comments to penetrate my 30 years of experience with myself would be doing myself a disservice when I could be spending that time creating content that hopefully helps people feel less alone about being single and not having children. I feel like you become this uh, this pioneer for for women of that genre and to give them freedom and to give them a voice of what that can be like. And that that perhaps um, is, you know, would you consider that being your next chapter for you? For sure. Yeah. I mean, thank you. That's so kind. I've never heard the term pioneer, but I'll, I'll accept it and I, I'll embrace it. I love it. Yeah, for sure. I worked so hard to get here. I used to be someone who was completely codependent on men. I used male validation to determine all of my self-worth. And I spent so much time crying in my therapy sessions, purging all of the beliefs that I had about myself as a girl who grew up overweight and thought that the only way she could be loved is if she was skinny. I worked so hard to get here. And the comments of people telling me, like, thank you so much. You bring so much joy to me. I loved your podcast episode you put out. I learned so much. That's what gets me through. And that is absolutely so much more purpose-driven than anything that I have embarked on. Yeah. And there's something that I even, you know, I, I think we we kind of touched on too, even on your episode. And what I'm actually hearing from you is, you know, in my book, I talk about kind of like the four different pillars of building your bounce factor, of building resilience. And, you know, the first part is really understanding to make peace with your past, right? We couldn't change the fact that you got trolled, yet can we make peace with it? And one of the ways what I'm hearing you say in making peace with it is, all right, for whoever is going through this, don't look at the comments. If it brings your mental health down or emotional health down or it makes you really anxious, don't don't engage with them. Just keep posting your truth. And if that is, and what I love about you is that with every single video, because I've even asked you about this too offline, you know, with every single video you start with, I'm 29, like you give your kind of mission statement or who you are statement. And I think that's, you know, I, I think that's smart because there's so many people, you know, for, for anybody who's listening to this, who we all create content, but I think it's so smart to position yourself in the way you want people to perceive you and the story that you are basically sharing online, which, you know, I, we have other people who've come on here talking about personal brands. I mean, that in and of itself, whether you want to build a personal brand or not, you're you're identifying yourself and that's that's huge because it also gives other women specifically permission to also kind of pave that storyline for themselves as well in whatever season and stage they are in life yeah and i think i think for me it was the one thing i was so afraid of being it was my shadow self of feeling fear that i would be alone at 30 but i'm not alone I'm 30 and single and fulfilled by my life. And so now I've taken that label and been like, yeah, I'm 30 and single. And like I say it with a smile. Mm -hmm. Was that ever a uh, like a, a number of uh, an, an unset expectation? Yeah. Yeah. 30 I felt like was when – I mean, my mom had me at 25 and I remember, you know, she, she at 30, I went to her 31st birthday and or 30th birthday and I was four and I remember it so clearly. And I, I just felt like I was going to have two kids and have my career at 30. And I think so many women fear 30. And I think there are women like the women in Sex in the City that made it okay for us to be single at, at 30s and be in our mid 30s and chase other dreams. I was always so fearful of 30. I don't know where I learned it. It must have been societal conditioning. But now I find myself 30 and single and happier than I ever was in any of those safe, good on paper relationships. So is that so bad? Wow. I, I like, I just kind of got chills because I'm processing you just turning 30 now, being here and uh, if, 
you know, in, in Vedic astrology, there's this idea of like every seven years you, you know, the kind of the planetary shifts kind of happen. And there's this thing where it's, you have the Saturn return and I'm by no means a (laughs) horoscope expert. I dabble here and there, but I would, I would not say that I know much about (laughs) horoscopes only to say that I'm an enthusiast. And I would share that, you know, I think you're right. There is a, there's a thing around 30. And if we even go into, you know, Vedic astrology, I don't know if they really say share this in Western, but there is this thing about your Saturn return. And it's usually at the end of your twenties and, and some people have it anywhere between, you know, the, the 27 to 32, you know, that sort of time period mark and you you kind of had yours, uh, this huge big awakening. Um, and it's all, it, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, coming back to yourself. And I know just reflecting back on what you just shared about your mom being 30 and you being four and, and vividly remembering that I, I mean, for me, it was walking out of my toxic, abusive marriage that I thought, okay, I made it. I did all of the things before 30 and oh wait, divorced also before 30. (laughs) So that is the badge, you know, the badge that, that we carry. And so what does that say for you now? And now what are you braving in this next frontier? And what message do you have for young girls who are, you know, navigating this? I think what it taught me is as someone who thought she would have two kids and a a husband at 30 and didn't, that you can't control anything. What's meant to be is going to happen. So just enjoy the ride. I tried to control this narrative of I will, you know, have this family at 30 And because it didn't pan out that way, and I realized that I'm still happy and thriving and doing well, then I'm going to finally just like release control to the universe, know that when I'm doing all the things that make me most fulfilled, make me my best self, stay grounded in my practices that I've learned and worked so hard to embrace into my life, I know all the doors I need to open will open for me and will all happen in the correct time. And the the silly tropes of you need to be at this point at 30, at at this point at 40, at this point at 50, that doesn't matter. It all doesn't matter. It's not like when you die on your gravestone, it's not going to say, oh, Nita got divorced at 30. It's not going to say any of that. It's going to say they were a wonderful person and here's how they helped. And they were beloved by so many people. So I'm just trying not to control the outcome. And what I would say to young women is enjoy it all. It, it It's all happening exactly as it's supposed to. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's so landed well. And it's, I think that, you know, it's this, this, this chase that we, that we all kind of, either internally have or projected to us by our family members or, you know, what we actually kind of grew up seeing or this fairy tale idea of what, you know, the society's un like subconscious expectations are laid on us. Um, there was a, you know, going through this whole big deal where literally almost you were, you were tweeted, you know, thousands of times when, when this, uh, you know, this, this literally became viral, like you were a pop culture sensation for about a week and, you know, a very famous dude came to your defense. Can you go, you know, and, and share like that interaction with him and, and how that sort of shaped now your voice and your content online? Yeah. Mark Cuban came to my defense. Don't think if you told me five years ago, you'd be, I'd be emailing with Mark Cuban. I would believe you, but he came to my defense. And because Matt Walsh said that I talked about how I I was going to be watching reality TV on this Saturday. And Matt Walsh said that my life revolves around celebrities and pop stars. And Mark Cuban humbled him and said, well, you're someone. And I think about it too. 
I think about this man who was pushing this traditional lifestyle and t- talking about how he has a family and kids. But meanwhile, he was tweeting about a girl on his Saturday instead of spending time with his family and kids. So I'm like, math's not mathing for me. But Mark Cuban humbled him and said, you're a guy who's glued to your phone and, and tweets about women all the time. He, t- he tweets about women. He talks about trans people. Like he's constantly bashing people on his phone. So you got to look within and you got to look inside the house. And I was, I think that the narrative really shifted once Mark Cuban came to my defense, especially because he was a man coming to a woman's defense. And Stephen Miller, who was a, a Trump advisor, asked him, you know, what his advice to me would be, um, because my life is so meaningless. And Mark Cuban said, well, first of all, she didn't ask me for her ad- advice. But if she did, like, here, here are the things. But I would tell her, I'm, it's so great that she brings joy to people. And I think it, it, it's so wonderful. And if she, and when it comes to about having kids, I'm not going to tell her what to do with her body because it's none of my business, which is exactly all men should take note. It's none of your business what a woman does with her body. If she chooses to reproduce or not, I don't think I'm impacting anyone's life with my decisions about starting a family. And so I... I um, ended up emailing with him and he was just so kind, so nice. And we related on the fact that he is second generation Russian Jewish too. So Mm. full circle, maybe in a past life, Mark and I were aligned in some way and we found each other in this life. And I tell all my friends, if he was a 40 year old single man, we'd be dating today. (laughs) (laughs) Go Mark Cuban. I mean, you know, it's like there are, you know, amazing heroes and heroines that, that come to kind of, I feel like the underdog and, you know, many times, um, when there is somebody that has so much voice and it seems like, you know, so much power to then kind of jump on, you know, not to say you're powerless, but to just jump on a very, true, you know, in for in voice that is just kind of minding her own business and to think that somebody or people like this actually exist and that's their job, that's their role to take other women down. I feel like I came across like, you know, Jamila Jamil and how she became an activist. And, you know, after going through a lot of her own issues with her body image and being on and off, you know, anorexic and literally just started to see how some of the images that were kind of portrayed when she was growing up were all around how thin you should be. And then 30 years later, they're still doing the same thing to young women around how our bodies should be. And so it's, it was one of those things where she's just like, okay, I'm going to start talking about this. But then her platform instantly became no, I need to be the voice for like the the unheard, the 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 folks who like how how is this actually happening? So I feel like in many ways what you're, you know, what you're starting to dive into for so many in in this young generation is, you know, standing on your own individual truth no matter what it looks like. And mm-hmm. and that's so powerful. Yeah, I hope so. I, I hope it helps. So what what do you now, Julia, see for yourself in this, uh, now that you're here in Austin, uh, congratulations on doing the hardest thing of letting go of like the golden handcuffs of a corporate job and you had a really high position. Um, and how uh, how is that all landing for you right now? I mean, I'm just so proud of myself for making the move. There was an opportunity where I could have stayed, but I just felt my gut pulling me and I needed a change. I was born and raised in LA. I was starting to feel stuck and stagnant. I wasn't my best best self. I was sleeping more than I needed to be. I wasn't getting outside enough. And in the week that I've been here, I can already tell like I have a backyard. I'm going outside. I'm going on walks. And I am doing this thing that I'm calling unattached autumn. So I'm not on dating apps 
and I am putting myself out there. I went out by myself this week and I have a date tonight. I have a date that I, I met someone in real life, which is shocking, <laughs> 2023. And I am also... I, everyone keeps making fun of me and I'm sure you are used to this, but I saw a video that said that Austin is the fifth worst city in the U S for dating. And why? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the data set is, but this, this was the data. It was a video that went viral on TikTok, and I'm trying to plan an event to help single people in Austin because this can't be the case. There are so many young people here we need to fix dating in Austin. And everyone keeps laughing like the girl who comes from the West Coast thinks that she can fix Austin. But that's that's what's on my radar. I'm hoping to create content that helps and resonates with people. I'm working on the podcast and meeting incredible people through that. Really, I'm just saying yes to a lot of things in life and unattaching myself from the societal noise, the pressure that I used to put on myself and enjoying the ride. Oh, I love the idea of unattached autumn. You know, I think that for so many of us, we are so fixated on the outcome or we're so certain and we have to plan every single step and make sure it comes to fruition. And so this is kind of, it's so freeing. And I think, you know, what I'm actually even hearing you share in all of this is, well, you know, it's it's that that sucked. Now what? Like I can't do anything about it. I already got trolled. I already got canceled, but I'm coming back as ferocious as ever. And, you know, you kind of take what you get. And I think that if that is a mantra that so many of us can actually surrender and let go of what is and just to kind of play in the magic of of whatever that mess is, I think that gives us a little bit more wiggle room to just, you know, explore and experience fully. And there you go. You've got a date. Yeah. Thank you. And your book and our conversation like helped me immensely. I remember you telling me, you said that I was rising up to the occasion and I felt I almost felt like if the woman who wrote That Suck Now What, the book about re being resilient, told me that I need to keep rising up to the occasion. So I credit you to a lot of that. <laughs> well, I mean, I do have to say, though, because friends who I know either who are so afraid of getting canceled, who they toe the line of being politically correct in all ways, and they don't mm -hmm. rock the boat. And you know, we're seeing this now in many ways, but I feel like you, and, and so they, they don't say anything, they keep quiet and they don't speak their truth and whatever, you know, whatever their truth is, they don't do it for fear of what you actually went through. And I had another friend who I think I shared, you know, when we were chatting where she did go through some sort of trolling and she and, and it was so bad that she ended up taking down, you know, the photo. And so, you know, this then poses a point of, well, can we actually have free speech? Why are we so worried about what other people are thinking? Yes, it is awful if you do get, you know, heavily trolled. And But you're somebody who lived through it. And I feel like there's so much resonance there. And I think the reason why I said you, you rose to the occasion, because there were so many other things that you could do. You could have kept your, you know, profile private, deleted it, changed, you know, the thing, um, not engage fully at all and just pretend like everything is okay. But you didn't do any of that. You, you faced it head on. And I think that has so much maybe you don't realize it now, it's, it's, it's going to still continue to kind of unravel. But I think from an outsider, it's one of the bravest things you can do and so courageous for so many people who struggle with this and even really big people, celebrities who they, they just don't want to rock the boat. So you'll never see that. And have we come to a place you know, I know we're on the brave table, but have we come to a place in society where we just have to do like the bare minimum to like be kind of under the radar so we don't ruffle any feathers? Or, and this is something that I've been playing around with, can we actually have more brave conversations? And brave conversations where we might actually ruffle some feathers 
like you did. <laughs> but but at the end of it, look at, you know, the what it's what's happened for you. And so for anybody who is listening to this that is so afraid of putting their voice out there in whatever way, I think that you know, you are such a fresh example of what can happen when you are actually ready. And I think that comes down to you being able to do the work. So, you know, what were some of those things that honestly prepared you for, for this moment? Um, for sure. Like tactically, I love journaling that helped me so much going to therapy. I shared with you, I've done plant medicine journeys twice now. And at those journeys, I understand they're not accessible to everyone, but I faced my shadow self. And what a lot of the work was, was feeling like I loved myself and I didn't love myself. There were two parts of me. There was the girl who was overweight and then the girl who lost 70 pounds. And once I understood that both of those girls were me and I embraced both versions of myself and loved myself and found myself being wholly one person and embracing all those parts of myself was where the sweet spot really happened when I started to genuinely love myself. And that allowed me to feel very rooted in who I was and do th understand what are the things that actually make Julia happy, not trying to put on a mask for society. You know, do I really like going to the bar on Friday nights and searching for men? Not really. I kind of like ordering in and renting a movie and being by myself and journaling. I kind of enjoy that. And sometimes I like it, but for the most part, there were certain things that I was doing to put up this facade. And so once I decided, decided to wholly be myself, I became much more rooted in who I was and what my message is. And so that's why when they tried to take me down with my message, I think that when people do the taking it down, taking the post down or, or deleting their profile is when they're not sure that that's really the message that resonates for them. You know, maybe they're like, oh, I feel pressure to put this social justice warrior post up and I'm going to do that because I feel this pressure. If you aren't certain that that's what you want to put out there, then you're going to feel the backlash. But I was so certain I lived it. I lived it for 10 years from 20 to 30. I felt this immense pressure. And I feel like there's this damned if you do, damned if you don't. If I didn't, I was feeling deeply unfulfilled inside and I was feeling very unlike myself. I did it and then I got bullied and controlled. So really there are these polarizing sides, but once you become rooted in who you are and what your message is, I think they can't shake you. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So how would you now describe what it means to be brave? I think it's knowing who you are, persisting with who you are, ignoring the outside noise, and continuing on. And what word would you say describes the season of life? Unattached. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Julia, you're, we're going to have to have you come back and dish out all things dating um, in, in this new frontier you're in. I'm so excited uh, that you are on this journey and, and thank you for just being so wise and, and paving the way for so many people that may not have as much of the courage as you literally innately have through your, your body and your pores. So um, with that, thank you for this conversation. And where thank can you. we all get a hold of you? Um, where can we all follow you and now follow along on your journey? Yes. So the podcast is pretty much done everywhere where you can find your podcasts. And I am PMD Pod on TikTok and Instagram. And I will be posting all the dating stories, unfortunately, for my parents. <laughs> Amazing. We can't wait for it. Thank Until you. next time on The Brave Table. So there were a lot of things that, again, as we evolve, as we evolve out of the old essence of who we once were, we are now shifting and changing. And that's a good thing. To be brave, to shift and change, to be brave, to ask yourself, hey, is this still lighting me up? What else am I curious about?